Um, I just wanted to make sure that all of you have <laughs> known of campus. Can, can, can I see a raise of hands of people who've been here before? They're familiar with the campus? Perfect. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to be then very short because it seems like we have a, a good um, amount of members here. I just wanted to make sure that, first of all, you were all signed up as members and you receive our newsletter for the best sound familiar with people on Sunday morning and Saturday night. Um, there's a lot of really, really, really good content and events happening here every day. Same like today, but every day there's a ton of stuff happening. So we really encourage you to sign up um, and follow our newsletter and then sign up for events. And then we also, since we uh, relaunched our activity here in November, uh, we also opened a startup cafe, which you may have noticed on your way upstairs. Um, so for early stage entrepreneurs in, in, in the audience um, who are looking for a place to work from, uh, then also feel free to sign up on our website for our uh, startup cafe membership. And then um, you'll get one of these badges and you're welcome to come here every day between nine and seven and work from our cafe. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna uh, invite to the stage uh, Oren Kefich, who's going to be our um, moderator for tonight. Uh, Oren is a director of, uh, of export accounts at Google Israel. And Micha Kaufman, um, who I imagine doesn't need an introduction, um, but Oren will probably take care of that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Um, as we said, I'm Oren Trefetz. I'm managing the uh, export clients and startups for Google and Israel. And one of our favorite and close clients and partners in Google Israel is uh, Fiverr, the company that Micha founded nine years ago, three days ago, right? In a week, okay, so uh, Wikipedia is wrong. Uh, so uh, a nine-years-old company that Micha founded uh, in 2010 started in Vinyamina, uh, as I remember, and then moved to this building in Tel Aviv. And that's why also it's very exciting for us to host him here in this building that currently is the Google Campus for Startups. Uh, and two years ago, he moved to an amazing building in Kaplan Street, not so far away from here. The traffic sometimes takes a bit longer. Uh, but it's a beautiful building that you're uh, housing today, and we are delighted to have you here to uh, hear a little bit about the journey of Fiverr, uh, your journey. You're uh, an entrepreneur since 2003, uh, so Fiverr wasn't your first uh, endeavor, uh, and I think that the crowd here will be interested to hear a little bit about the journey, a little bit about uh, what led you to the point uh, that you're in today. And we'll start with a few questions that I will ask, and then we'll open it up to questions from you guys uh, to uh, ask directly uh, regarding Micha, regarding Fiverr, or regarding whatever is interesting for you. So uh, without further ado, where did you come up with the idea? Fiverr? What is it? All right, so um, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming. I'm I'm going to try and say some stuff that sounds smart so you don't feel like you wasted your time. Um, so um, Fiverr came to be um, from, from an idea. Um, it wasn't something um, too dramatic. Um, it started as a, as a conversation between myself and my co-founder. Um, both of us have been uh, working with freelancers quite extensively um, throughout our careers. Um, and at least enough to know that um, it's not fun. Um, you, so when you think about traditional freelancing, um, usually it's uh, it's pretty similar to dating, <coughs> actually. Um, the, the, way, the way most people uh, do business with freelancers is that they um, ask some of their friends if they know someone good at something specific, like, do you know a good graphic designer? And you might wait a little while and get a few names and then um, get in touch with these people and eventually uh, get engaged uh, in a conversation with someone who you think is good for the job. Um, and then all of a sudden you, you find yourself um, on a date at Starbucks, whatever, or in, in Israel. Um, 
and and, you, and yeah, whatever. And, and 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 you guys are sitting and looking into each other's eyes and figuring out if you want to work together and stuff like that. So it's basically a date. And if you if you actually decide that you want to work together, then there's the prenup. Um, you need to come up with a, a, a contract, right? And we figure out the uh, the mechanics and the um, you know, how to run this entire thing. So it's super high friction. It takes a long time, and it's not fun. And so um, the idea of Fiverr was was really to say, you know, it was it was late two thousand and nine. Um, so it was it was well after the e-commerce revolution. And to say, you know, uh, we've been educated to do this very basic, you know, e-commerce stuff, which is you go on a on a catalog on a website and you browse or you do a search, you find something, you click, order, and it's done. Um, and the idea was, can can we actually make the purchasing of a service from a freelancer online as easy as buying a product on Amazon? That, that was kind of the genesis of the idea. Um, and, and, and from that, I would, I would actually share one piece of advice that I share with, uh, with entrepreneurs that are seeking, you know, looking for their next big idea. Um, if you're in the software business, and other businesses are very different, but if you're in the software business, um, if you think about, think about what to do next, what I would do if I were in your shoes is, I would look for an existing market that is very, very big, that has tremendous amount of friction and very low efficiency, where software can actually make a change. What I just said right now describes Amazon, Airbnb, Uber, WeWork, Fiverr, and a bunch of other companies. So if you if you take very high friction, low efficiency, and you can through software solve that. If you can take, you know, taxi was a it was a huge business, but it was a, an existing business. Nobody thought that this, you know, market can be disrupted. But through the use of a of an app, with one click, it solved a lot of the friction of calling the cab, knowing when it's going to arrive, knowing when you're going to get there, and paying one click. It's amazing. They didn't invent anything, much like Airbnb didn't invent couchsurfing or you know, uh, hospitality. Yeah. So, so this was kind of the, the genesis so of the you, you made it sound relatively easy to find a place that you can disrupt and, and add the layer of software and boom, you make it happen, Airbnb and Amazon and Fiverr and, and Uber and so on. But I, I'm wondering from your perspective, in nine years ago, what was the initial stages of building the the product strategy and you said a date on a Starbucks or an aroma but how do you do it and how you roll out a new product and how you make the decisions if you can reflect on that as well yeah so um, so there were uh, as usual we're trying to oversimplify stuff but basically um, for me uh, Fiverr being my fourth company um, I wanted to build a company that would that would grow grassroots I um, I spend um, so much time raising money for my previous startups. I, I've raised money from family and friends and local angels and international angels and local VCs. And kind of, like I didn't want to raise money again. I wanted this to be a bootstrap company at the beginning. Um, and again, th this is this is like ten years ago. This is way way before rapid development before. Um, you know, current front-end technologies, libraries, shit like that. The cloud was just at the beginning. Um, so this was not not as easy as it is, it is today. Today, it's, you know, everything is hackable. Everything is um, relatively commodity. Um, but we wanted to create this, this um, um, uh, core of a product that would be um, <coughs> sticky enough and viral enough and have a business model baked into it that it would that it would actually work from transaction number one, um, and and grow organically, uh, virally, and so and, and this is where the five dollar came in into place. Um, and the idea was that th this was this was um, this was pretty interesting because 
on the one hand, it's it's almost like a gimmick, right? It's like, you know, the, the tagline, I, I was I was running a, a Google Doc um, with uh, options for taglines, and I, I I think I had like 400. And, and the last one, which when we went live with, um, was the things people do for $5. This was kind of the thing that people saw when they come in, when they came in, and and basically the the way the homepage looked like was was this list of of, of services we call them, we coined them gigs, um, and it started with the words I will blank for five dollars, and there was a form up here, so people thought that if if they type something and click submit, it would go in. In reality, it actually took them to a different page without text, and they had to fill in a few other details. That was it. But basically, we, we really lowered the, the barrier for people to enter. And the idea was the beauty about what, why five. So, you know, we, we found five to be a number that people don't think about um, too many times before they actually spend it. Um, now I'm, usually I say it's it, you know it's the it's a price of a frappuccino at Starbucks. You don't you don't think you know ten times before you actually spend five dollars. And if if it's not as tasty as you would expect, you're not devastated. Just you just throw it away. Or you just say, hey, can you make a, a new one, a fresh one? And so that that was kind of the idea. And what this allowed us to do was to be um, to not invest too much into screening the supply, right? Because it's $5. The, the amount of damage that they can do is, is very small. And so and so, it was pretty much a, 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 a self-selection se self process because uh, we had the rating system baked in and so people started getting rating. And so it was very obvious who was good and who was shit. So, um, so it, was, it was very easy to, to screen that. And from that point on, you know, the idea was if that grows fast enough and big enough, then it, it would make sense to, you know, to raise money, grow the company, and um, introduce stuff like price elasticity where, you know, we, we increase price points and, and so forth. Regarding the uh, marketing, so when you open a marketplace like Fiverr, you have on one end the sellers, on the other end, the buyers, and you need to create a friction between them that will create uh, the business flow. Uh, what, is, what was your um, strategy when it comes to marketing? How you built uh, the, the traction with the sellers and with the buyers in parallel? Because if you have sellers and don't have buyers, then you have a, a big issue there and vice versa. So how did you address it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll so you don't do it in parallel. Um, so the reality is, and I'll be very deterministic here, um, from my experience, and um, it's not a lot, it's just 10 years, but from that 10 years of experience uh, building a marketplace, I would say that um, maybe with very, very few cases of commodity, um, when you create a two-sided marketplace, you always start from supply, period. End of story. So it's not parallel. So if you think about Amazon was inventory, Airbnb, hosts, Uber, drivers, fiber, sellers, that was it. Like you obsess 100% on your supply. And, um, and that take, takes care of itself. And so, you know, fast forward, the, the, you know, the funny how the story um, rolled out. For the first, I think for the first, um, three, maybe four years um, of the company, we didn't spend a single cent of marketing. Um, it was 100% organic. So we, we just we just focus on on making sure that we have the right supply. And we, um, we um, developed our catalog as, as an e-commerce business where it's basically built as a, as a catalog with a, with a search engine and a liquidity management technology and all of that, um, it, was, it was just putting that in place. And the rest just was, as, as we hoped and we were extremely lucky to, to get it, was 100% organic. And what happened after four years? 
We started doing marketing because we saw that the demand is there, uh, or the supply is there, but the demand is lower. What happened after four years? So, um, so I think after uh, after this initial time where we were completely obsessed about, you know, when, when you start, you, you create a product, right? At the beginning, it, so you you build something from an idea. You have a concept of how you think. Um, freelancing should be or how you productize services so that you can you can create an e-commerce platform in reality you know your audience your community comes in and they use the product the way they want to use it which is oftentimes slightly different than what you what you plan and so at the beginning we were completely obsessed about about iterating the product and making it better and, and, and creating a better user experience and then starting to do um, to introduce new prices and new ways to actually uh, get into these prices. And we uh, introduced a new rating system and um, a leveling system that we, that we um, invented. Um, and at some point, you, you get to a, you get to a, a, a growth uh, rate that you say, okay, great, so I'm, I'm growing at a whatever uh, rate a year. Um, I'm trying to, I'm starting to understand my, you know, the, the basics of the business, you know, um, how people spend their tendency to go through categories, uh, their lifetime value, stuff like that. And you start thinking, okay, great. So I'm, I'm getting all of this organically. Can I augment? Can I supplement? Can I add to it by being more proactive? Um, and reaching also newer audiences that are not yet exposed to this revolution that is happening. And it is, guys, just the vast majority, and I'm talking beyond 90% of freelancing is still happening offline. It's crazy, right? Um, There's still 90% opportunity, that's how you say it. Um, it's actually more than 90, but um, w when we started, I think it was 99 or 98, which is crazy, I mean, we, um, when when I talk to people here or in, in San Francisco or in New York, same same locations, where I, I always say we we live in La La Land, right? We, we think that everything is online, that everybody's connected, that like it's wrong. You know, there's over 30 million SMBs in the U.S. alone. There's one SMB born every minute, um, and this doesn't include organizations and not not for profit and stuff. Like that. These businesses do not actually know that you can hire a freelancer online. That's that's insane. So there's there's a huge job in educating the market. And so when you think about marketing, there is there's two avenues for it. Like, and I'm, again, I'm, I'm being I'm generalizing, but there's there's the growth marketing, which is which has the performance marketing, which which is working with, with partners like like Google, um, and there's the brand marketing. Um, which is also working with partners at Google, um, <laughs> but also doing out of home, doing TV, doing you know, doing other uh, uh, types of media um, that might be less of not PPC, but you do you do YouTube, um, and you you think about anything from awareness through consideration to conversion. So it's so when you understand that you have that tremendous amount of opportunity out there. Um, you you go from just catering to the hardcore, low hanging fruit, you know, early adopters and you start expanding the the, the circles of adoption. Okay. Let's go a little bit backwards in time. Okay. So we talked about the product, we talked about the marketing. There's a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, um, small Startups that are trying to build their uh, business models, their products currently uh, here in this room. And if you can uh, reflect on your experience, both from Fiverr and maybe from your previous endeavors, what will be the recommendation? And what are the two main things uh, that you, as an entrepreneur that starts in your uh, kitchen or in your uh, coffee shop next uh, next to your home, what are the things that you need to take care of? And what were uh, the advices that you got that helped? A hard one. Yeah. 
don't listen to advice from people that sit on stages. <laughs> um, okay, no <noted>. tip. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if there's like, if there's two. Um, the thing that I would say is, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and doing it over and over again um, um, takes a lot of energy. And the number one recommendation that I would that I would give is, um, if you do it, just do something you're really, really passionate about. Um, I know it, it sounds fluffy, but um, if you're gonna spend you're gonna spend the better, you know, years of your life struggling for something, and it's gonna be there's gonna be more. I mean. Uh, physically, it's impossible, but it's going to feel like you. There's more downs than ups, um, and so you you better off doing something <laughs> that you're that you really really love um, and that you feel is creating value for people, for humankind. Um, there, there's a there's plenty of entrepreneurs that are doing opportunistic things, and that. I'm not criticizing anyone. I'm just saying, but if, if if it was me, it was probably you know, it's, it's doing something that uh, that you're connected to, um, and that you think uh, serve people in a, in a very positive way. Um, beyond that, um, you know, it's it's remembering that it's um, you know it's. It has everything to do with the people that surround you. Um, uh, and it, it goes to my next question, the people. Okay. Because when you look at small startups, usually you start with two partners, maybe three, and then all of a sudden you have a product, and the product is scaling, and it works organically, and then you think about scaling it, and doing growth hacking, and maybe going into marketing, and obviously you need more people, and you need to scale the business in terms of, of, of human beings that you need to interact with, which creates another level of complexity. And uh, thinking about your um, operations currently at Fiverr, you started two people uh, in, in Binyamina nine years ago, and now you have well, close to 400 people uh, scattered around the globe, basically, in, in Europe and the US and here in Tel Aviv. How do you manage this? I mean, what kind of uh, advices or learnings do you have from, from that perspective? Because I think this is one one of the major obstacles uh, for entrepreneurs that can have the technical capabilities, that can have the maybe in marketing capabilities, but when it comes to managing businesses at scale from the human capital standpoint, that's a, that's a huge challenge as well. And, th and that's probably one of the most important ones. Um, just to finish the, the thought that I was having before, so um, um, it was taking me to people. What I, it, it might sound stupid, but I'll say it anyway, um, because I really, really believe in it. Spend a few hours a day reading. Seriously. Um, it makes a world of difference. Read news, read um, um, things that have to do with your market, with your tech. Read about entrepreneurship. Don't take anything too serious. But um, spending a lot of time reading inspires you, you know, releases neurons in a, in a very funny and unpredicted, uh, unpredictable ways um, that would, that will spark your imagination. So, so this is something that I do and I, I really encourage people to do. Um, I can spend two or three hours a day reading um, in total um, and I, I wish I could spend more than that. So um, going back to people, um, I think there's there's very interesting phases when you build the company to scale, um, which we're still in a in a small scale world, 400 and something. Um, it's not thousands, it's not tens of thousands, which you know, is, a, is a whole different uh, complexity as, as you guys probably know, um, and I don't. Um, but there is I've noticed that there were like moments in time in that building up the team where. Um, there's a crossroads where things change, and in our case, it was um, it was um, around um, you know about 35 people. Then that that was kind of the first 
um, uh, first milestone, and then every time you doubled. It was 70 or 75, and then 150, and then 300. Probably the next one is going to be six, 600. Um, and each time, it's a, it's a different challenge. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I've, I've told this story many times, but um, it, around the time of we were 30 and we were still in Vietnamina, and we had a, a terrible time hiring. It was really difficult to get people there um, with the train and everything. And 90% were coming from Tel Aviv anyway, because um, I don't know if you know, but 80 or 85% of the uh, computer science graduates are from Tel Aviv in Israel. So it's, it's not you know it's not a coincidence that everybody all the time is here. So it was it was really hard, and this was this was really why at that time in, in Benjamin that this was completely <laughs> from an HR perspective it was terrible. Like people were hanging out the office without shirts. Um, it was hot. <laughs> the, the air conditioning was not great, and um, and and we had this this guy uh, developer, and he, I was sitting in in one corner, um, and he came to me without the shirt, um, uh, hit the table and said, "Boss, I can't do it anymore." And I said, "What now?" He said, "You know, it's corporate. I I can't send it." So many people. <laughs> um, so, so this was this was kind of um, it's, it's a true story. So this this is kind of that, that was a good sign that um, we needed to change the first you know, batch of people into um, maybe more advanced you know people that can actually cope with other people in the same room um, and. Um, but that was a story. So, and and then every time it was every time we multiplied, and and I think I think the secret is um, you obsess about culture very early on, not as like because it's written in, in a book. Um, you, you need to do it if you care, and if you don't care, you have a problem. But um, if you're lucky enough, you have a, a co-founder that cares about it, and someone needs to and needs to um, give time to thinking about what this company should be like, um, w what working for this company should be like, um, what are the type of, you know, type of people that this company should hire. Um, and it's not about conforming people. It's not about, you know, picking the same people or trying to make people that come into the company the same person. It's the other way around. It's being open to diversity. Um, it's um, celebrating the uniqueness of the, the fact that people come from different backgrounds, but it's it's about thinking about w what are the values and then hiring people that could do this work better than you. Um, this the hiring work and then propagating the DNA and, and the last thing I would say that th there's a there's a point in time that everybody uh, goes through when you reach 150 people, uh, which is pretty unique and it, it's funny because today I had this. Uh, Every every few weeks we have a gathering where the new batch of people that uh, joined in the you know uh, uh, last two or three weeks um, come to my room and, and we we have a chat and we talk and the first thing that I say to them is I'm not going to remember you uh, which is terrible it's like and I acknowledge that it's terrible um, and the reason is there's there's this law called the Dunbar law, uh, which states that in close uh, groups, human beings are able to remember up to 100 or 150 individuals. That's our limitation. And so I, I always apologize for it. And I say, I'm not going to remember you. Um, and, I, and you're the most important thing for this company. I mean it. Um, try not to embarrass me. So when you approach me, try to remind me who you are and what's your name and it's human and if you want to test it try and remember the other 400 whatever people and you're gonna you know see that you can't so it's 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 about these little things that you need to let go and understand that you know 
it's at some point you you lose that level of intimacy and control and, and under you know familiarity with people and their stories. I, I totally agree. And I totally agree regarding the culture thing. You know, trying to keep the culture and, and have some kind of um, ownership of one of the founders at least that is maintaining the, the culture that uh, was in the beginning, although it's becoming more and more complicated while you're growing. Uh, before we move to questions from uh, the very quiet audience that we have here, uh, we talked about the past and the present, a little bit about the future. So looking 10 years from now, five years from now, let's, let's talk about five. Where do you see this company? Where do you see yourself uh, leading five years? How do you see the growth of your nine-year-old baby? Um, so it is a baby, not, not in the emotional um, aspect of it. I'm not, like, I'm not attached to it as you would be attached to a kid. Um, I think that people that talk about you know companies as if they're or their kids um, have a problem with their priorities, um, but um, but I'm extremely extremely excited about where we are and what we're doing. There's you know Fiverr is doing a tremendous contribution to the world. There's a there's a there's almost like a, a new wave of industrial revolution that is happening uh, right now. Um, with freelancing that used to be about 30% of the American workforce uh, less than 10 years ago, which is now about 40%, 40% of the American workforce are independent workers. That is huge. Um, and it's largely driven by millennials, um, which I'm not. Um, I'm not a part of, um, but it is changing. It is changing paradigms. It is changing how we think about um, our time and location and how we want to spend it and the types of things that we want to get involved in and the type of people that we want to be connected with. And um, you know, we. Um, we have a mission that, that speaks about you know changing the way the world works together. Um, uh, the, the, the way the world works together is changing, and we can be a part of it. We can lead some of it, and I think we're very fortunate to be to be able to be a part of that. Um, it is creating jobs for people. It is connecting people that were um, uh, previously very limited to their. Uh, neighborhoods and having access to talent or to clients from very small areas and now are international all of a sudden. And I'm very proud of it. And I, I think that um, if we can be as relevant as we are today, 10 years from now, and if, if I can, if I have the strength and, um, and capacity to continue leading this, I, I would be extremely happy. So there's there is a sense of day one in the company. There is a sense of everything is young. You know, everything could be disrupted. Um, you know, we should be the ones who disrupt ourselves. Because if not, it's going to be someone else. Um, so there is a lot of thinking about how do we how do we improve that model? How do we extend it? Just a follow up question on that. You said growing, changing the world. What about the focus in Israel? The fact that uh, the majority of the employees currently are based in Israel is something that you see also for the future uh, of this company? I don't see a reason why that would not be the case unless there is a limitation of talent. Um, and I think that, that that might be the case. And um, um, to some degree, um, that ability is capped by companies like Google um, and others that are coming in and need you know, a billion developers um, in Tel Aviv only, um, which, which means that, right, um, no, that's a billion and a half total. Um, my, my point is, they're, they're, the only thing li limit, um, limiting us here is, is access to, to talent, right? Um, we decided to put our headquarters in Israel. That was, um, that was a decision that um, uh, a part of it was, this is our base and we're very proud of it and we want to create jobs here and we want to pay income tax here um, 
is that theoretically goes back to us, just theoretically, um, <laughs> um, or very theoretically. Um, and, um, and there's tremendous amount of talent here as well. Uh, but it's, it's limited. It's very, very limited. It's, yeah. Some of it is sitting here. In the, and by the way, we're, um, I was asked by our HR to say that we're looking for people, fire.com slash jobs. Um, yeah. Search it, Google. <laughs> or, or search it on Google. Okay, uh, we'll move to your questions. So we have this very creative mic here. Somehow. My question is, um, where, what was the company status um, the first time you funded, uh, you funded the, you raised money, and how did you manage until that point? Um, so, so we spent, um, did everybody get the question? Can I repeat it? Um, how old was the company when we raised, we raised money and how did we get by until that point? Or, that was a fair question. Not only how old you were, okay. but what was the status, how many employees, status, okay. what was okay. incomes, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, so basically we, we spend about um, eight or nine months building the company. Um, at that point, we um, it was just the two founders and um, another freelancer um, that we hired. Um, so um, we had a decent amount of um, capability between the three of us. All three of us could code. Um, the two founders, we well, we were also designers, so we we, we hacked the entire thing ourselves. Um, and at that point, we just, it was just savings. So basically it was our money, uh, including paying to that uh, third person. Um, and, and actually, this, this was pretty much how we have uh, ran the thing up until we went live. Um, when we went live, um, um, it went a little bit out of control too fast. Um, and, and so it was it was family members and stuff like that just to keep the lights on and just you know making sure that things are, are gonna go okay um, and we continue to manage the business I was doing a hundred percent of the time customer support um, which I highly recommend that people do when when you launch a business um, that that's the single most important role in the company at that point um, because that that's pretty much the only, um, un unless you want to hurt yourself by reading vicious comments on blogs, um, people that are irrelevant to, you, to your business anyway, um, I, I would engage with customers. So, so it's spending 100% of my time doing customer support. And that was kind of like the three, first three months. Um, and at that point, um, so we were making, we were making a little bit of money the first transaction happened in the first day. Um, and um, I don't remember exactly what, we, what were the, the exact revenues, but the graphs were looking like they were going into the right direction. <coughs> Enough to do a seed round. Um, I know that today when we say seed round, we're talking about $20 million. Um, <laughs> at that time, doing seed round was uh, a couple of hundred thousands of dollars so we made a million uh, which was a very healthy round at that point and th that was angels um, so I, I don't remember exactly the revenues it, it was it was not something to write home about but it was enough to show that there there was a there was a there was a very clear trend the amount of services that were added to the platform was was increasing very fast the social mentioning was ballistics um, I gave the first interview which as I said to you I'm 
the idea was not to hype the media. The media came to us. That was okay. Um, which was for the Wall Street Journal. Um, which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, does not bring a lot of traffic. Um, because their readership is not relevant to any business, almost. Um, but the funny thing about that story was that the Wall Street Journal uh, has, a, has, a, has a nice syndication uh, agreement. And one of the places where they syndicate their content was to Yahoo. Do, do you know what Yahoo is? <laughs> so 10 years ago, Yahoo was huge, huge in content. And the story hit the Yahoo homepage for two minutes. And then for two hours on the homepage of Yahoo Business. Um, and at, at that, we just went out of business completely at that point. We just melted. Um, we had, in, in two hours, we had like um, uh, maybe two and a half million uniques. Um, uh, getting to, we had to add servers. We had to, like it, everything was shutting down. Like all of the email providers, including Gmail, uh, you know, uh, Sandbox, uh, because we were we're a non-existing domain, and all of a sudden we're sending a billion emails because we're confirming people's registrations. So everybody shut shut us off, and then um, uh, the payment providers shut us off because all of a sudden we were, we were making all the money. Out of nothing. Um, so that was the first crisis in many, 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 